Last week, one of our members, uh, who I, I think it's okay for me to say, uh, African-American man, Julian, uh, made a comment uh, in which uh, he was basically saying, not to put words into his mouth, and uh, if he's here, I want to give him a chance to speak up for himself at some point. He was basically saying, as I raised the topic, the classic Buddhist topic last week of impermanence, what about, number one, the lasting impact of trauma on people? And frankly, what about the lasting nature of racism, uh, discrimination, prejudice, police brutality, and all the rest of that. Very profoundly important question and topic. Uh, I scrambled a bit at the end, uh, did the best I could to, to, re to respond in my own way, but I've spent the week, like many, deeply reflecting about these subjects. Uh, one expression of those reflections went out today to 150,000 people on my newsletter list. Uh, for my just one thing practice. And this week it simply says vote. I have my own preferences, but fundamentally, I don't care who people vote for. I care deeply that they vote at all. And there are many ways to vote, not just at the ballot box. We vote with our words, our deeds. I'm voting in a certain kind of way by focusing us tonight on these topics. We vote inside our own minds as well. Uh, we, vote in, we vote in many kinds of ways, and we vote for ourselves, even if it doesn't seem to change the world around us. And living through the life that I've had, uh, in which I became politically aware in the 1960s, it's clear to me that gradually, slowly but surely, uh, the, the votes, the accumulating force of the votes that people cast with their feet, with their money, with their time, with their words, with their deeds, with their thoughts, can gradually add up to a mighty stream that can make a real difference over time. It's no guarantee, but what is guaranteed is that if people don't vote, uh, nothing will get better. So I wanna offer some points uh, related to the fundamental Buddhist teaching of impermanence and clarify some of the distinctions related to that. And then I wanna use that in part as a way to frame and speak to um, the quotation that I sent out this week for this meditation gathering, which essentially has to do with the value of uh, helping ourselves, the value of practicing inside our own minds and cultivating qualities such as lovingness and peacefulness inside our own minds uh, for the sake of others as well as for ourselves. So impermanence. First way of understanding impermanence is the inherently ephemeral nature of our experiences in the moment. In this moment, they are continually changing. They're shifting, even something that seems stable like depressed mood or helpless outrage itself, it has a kind of quivering, shimmery, I think of it as effervescent somehow quality. And the Buddha really emphasized this uh, fact of our experience. It's inherently impermanent nature in the present. He emphasized that not just because it's true, but because the deepening recognition of that, the deepening feeling of that um, can help shift our relationship to what we're experiencing so that we're less hijacked by it. It feels less solid, less brick-like, less burdensome. And we lighten up about it. We take it, in a sense, less seriously in problematic ways. We take it less personally in some sense. And we become less inclined to fight with certain kinds of experiences we're having. We become more accepting, more open, more spacious, uh, more allowing. And we become less inclined to chase after particular experiences to get them or hold on to them. Right there, in this recognition of impermanence, one of the very fundamental teachings of the Buddha, we see a capacity, a power that we all have in the midst of our experiences to shift our relationship with them to something that is more spacious, lighter, freer, 
and one with less suffering. So that's one way to understand impermanence. A second way to understand it is that certain experiences, without a doubt, have a certain stability even as they change. And this is good in some ways, right? The stability of compassion, the stability of moral commitments to others, the stability of um, the intention to be an ally to others. These have a certain stability to them. They're not completely impermanent. Uh, those experiences, those traits within a particular person are impermanent over the course of that person's lifetime if, as the body eventually passes away, but they have a real stability to them. That's true. It's also true that certain experiences of a different kind have a stability, depressed mood, uh, the long shadow of trauma, deeply embedded inhibitions, um, you know, the kind of inner muzzle on the mouth. That has stability as well. Um, and I want to acknowledge that. The Buddha certainly did not say that wasn't true. In fact, he talked about the relatively stable, enduring effect of our, our wholesome intentions and the enduring effect as well of things like ill will or greed or uh, envy for others. So these are, it's real. So just because the standing wave in any moment is continually changing does not mean that it does not have some fundamental kind of stability. It's also true that many external conditions can have a very enduring quality for better or worse. Uh, the people who are your friends that you can really count on, the skills you've developed in your life, the, um, the conditions you've earned in your life that endure, these are, these are things to rely upon. Social institutions that are far from perfect, but are certainly better than um, living, uh, you know, at some other times in history, let's say. Uh, you know, those are, those are good things, right? On the other hand, it's absolutely true. And we've seen it uh, recently, uh, obviously, in the, the murder of George Floyd, uh, so many other examples of, um, you know, completely inappropriate uh, behavior by law enforcement. Uh, we see many other intractable conditions. Uh, you know, roughly one in five children in America still lives in poverty, which was the case uh, when I grew up myself as a child. And um, these are relatively intractable. They're relatively stable. That's to be acknowledged. That's to be named and seen. And then meanwhile, the question becomes, what do we do about it, right? How do we respond to um, what is relatively stable and harmful and full of suffering? How do we respond to that? The Buddha, for whatever it's worth, uh, was not a political reformer per se. He did certain things in his time. They were really quite radical. He welcomed people uh, who were not among the Brahmin caste to his Sangha uh, under some serious prodding from his mother, apparently. He welcomed women eventually to the monastic order. Uh, but he himself lived at a time with slavery, with wars, with kings. He said various things about the proper conduct of, of people in power and the responsible use of power, uh, whether it's in a family or in a country. But on the whole, he did not particularly focus there. So uh, one thing I think is really useful is that Buddhism, like any ism, does not have everything to say about how to make the world better. And it can't be really, um, I think, looked to for a comprehensive approach. It, like Islam or Christianity or secular mindfulness or psychology uh, or the, the, the wisdom of the first people, the indigenous people who walked the earth, um, you know, that can offer a lot, but it's not necessarily the complete package. So in that context then, uh, I would say that the Buddha had two, uh, I think, relevant, currently pieces of advice for people. And we can see for ourselves whether they ring true and are helpful over time. One piece of advice is really summarized in the quotation this week, which I'll read to you again. 
If one going down into a river, swollen and swiftly flowing, is carried away by the current, how can one help others across? If we're carried away by fear or anger or greed or paralysis, immobilization, uh, if we're carried away by the desire to look away and swerve and take the easy path, uh, we cannot help other people. And so one of the great teachings of the Buddha is to clean up our own side of the street, uh, take care of our own issues inside ourselves and between ourselves and other people. Uh, clean house ourselves. And think of the apparent final words of the Buddha translated, um, I think, profoundly as things fall apart, things are impermanent, tread the path with care. Tread your path with care, with conscientiousness and heart. In other words, to put it a certain kind of way, vote. Claim the power you have and use it minimally inside your own mind and outwardly as appropriate as well. So that's, that's the first core teaching of the, of the Buddha. Take care, you know, take care of yourself, work on yourself, help yourself suffer less, help yourself harm other people less, take care of your own side of the street. Tremendous emphasis on that, particularly in the Theravadan tradition of the roots of what the Buddha taught. Second, absolutely, again and again and again, he emphasized compassion and kindness for others. Uh, modern scholarship suggests that he actually said that the path of love is a wholly complete path to ultimate enlightenment and liberation. He talked about the metta sutta, the loving kindness sutta, in which we are to offer compassion and kindness without ill will as a mother would offer her life to her child, her only child, omitting none, radiating in all directions. It doesn't mean that we have to agree with people or approve of them. It doesn't mean that we're not allowed to speak truth to power. There are actually a number of famous stories after the Buddha passed away in which uh, monastics who had trained in his tradition faced very powerful kings who could have, who could have ordered them slain on the spot and in their own way spoke truth to power. Uh, in fact, in some cases, to persuade a particularly powerful king in Northern India a couple hundred years after the Buddha passed away, I'm, I confess I cannot recall his name or pronounce it probably, uh, who then himself became a great patron of the Buddhist tradition. So, you know, we are called, we are called to uh, make that vote, make that choice inside our own being, inside our own heart, to um, have a recognition of the suffering of others, to have compassion for others, while holding true to our own morality, our own view of what is the greatest good, and with a fundamental fearlessness that is also peaceable and friendly. Uh, in the Just One Thing newsletter I just sent out, uh, it finishes with a teaching from the Dalai Lama, who's talking about Tibet and the systemic racism that Tibetans experience on their own soil from the Chinese government. And um, he also talks about responding to the plague, the coronavirus uh, epidemic, pandemic that's sweeping across the world. You know, he talks about that. And one of the things that is so clear in the words of the Dalai Lama, including with regard to the Chinese government, which has brutalized and terrorized the Tibetan people for several generations now. Um, he does not come to this with hate. He comes with this, to this with clarity, sometimes with anger, with an absolutely fierce commitment to what rings true to him as right, but without letting the poison of hatred invade and hijack his heart. So I think these are two fundamental principles, you know, clean up our own side of the street, do our own inner practice, take care of ourselves, while also not putting others out of our heart, even if we choose to put them out of the halls of power. Okay. And now I'd love to open it up
for other people. Um, we're in this together. Uh, you know, I have no monopoly on wisdom. The Buddha certainly has no monopoly on wisdom. And collectively, I'm really interested in what the rest of you have to say. So I want to see uh, if you want to, if you care to speak succinctly, if you want to offer a comment or succinctly if you have a question so that we can get as many voices uh, in the space as possible here. And then I will kind of be careful to make sure that tonight we end on time uh, in a kind of formal way. Uh, and then those who want can stick around and Tom, Tom will move you into breakout rooms. Okay, so if you have a comment or question, you can certainly offer it in the chat uh, down below. Um, and um, in you know typing, people will see it. I'll see it as well. And if you care to speak, uh, if you care to put your voice into the space, uh, please just raise your hand. I see one hand already, so I'll, I'll work. So Carly, I'll call on you first. And also, if you just want to wave your hand, uh, I'll see it as well, kind of an informal way to do it. And I'm going to tend to call on people in particular who haven't spoken before. But so if I don't call on you, it's not because I'm rejecting you. I'm just trying to create space for as many people as possible. Okay, Carly, I'm unmuting you. Yeah. I'm, takes a moment, Carly, for, there you are. You are unmuted, Carly. Um, I've been thinking about what happened last week for quite some time and the rising tide of anti-Asian sentiments in Canada, particularly on the West Coast. Um, and it reminds me of something that uh, I used to live by when I was involved in the law, and that was never look for justice in the world, but never cease to give it. Mm. Mm. Because there's never justice in the world. Justice is always something that we perceive it to be. Mm. And blessed are the peacemakers, they'll all make peace as soon as they get even. When the, the fighting will start once our side is even. So, I mean, you might as well just give up and just try and be as just as you can. Mm -hmm. Which brings me to the second point. And mm -hmm. the happiness hypothesis by Jonathan Haidt. Oh, yeah. Jonathan Haidt is a professor of psychology at the University of Virginia. And he, was, he made a comment about the similarity between Buddhism and impermanence and the Stoics. Hmm. And he said, if you look back at the time when these two philosophies were developing, they both lived in times where warlords would sweep through hmm. every five years, every 10 years, you'd just build up everything, you'd get everything right, you'd marry the girl, you'd have the kid, and then the warlords hmm. would come through and take everything that you had. And right. so you really had to be a stoic or you had to realize that everything was impermanent because there was no way of surviving otherwise. So yeah. just two observations. Well, Carly, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, so I'm gonna mute you. Oh, you're muted, great. So anybody else, uh, comment? Okay, I see Becky. Um, great, I'm gonna unmute you, Becky. Takes a moment apparently for the unmute to work. Do, do, do. Whoa. Becky, you might need to unmute yourself as well. There you go. Okay, Becky. So uh, just in the context of that metaphor that you've often referred to of the stream of consciousness where we're all, we're eddies in the stream. Yeah. That for each of us to be working on ourselves, yeah. working on what we can about ourselves, for ourselves, making the world our, from where we are as as good as we can as we go along, it makes complete logical sense to me that we have an impact that we may not always perceive that mm -hmm. we're having, except possibly we would perceive that on our, on our own personal level that, that we feel more peaceful. Hopefully that would be true, but that we, I, I do believe that we have a, a larger impact that is less easy to pinpoint and say, oh, yeah, see, my practice made a difference there. Yeah, we may not see it that way, but that I, I do believe that it, it is making that kind of difference. When we well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, 
you know, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, sort of two brief stories about that or, you know, kind of teaching stories. Uh, the one is that the lie makes a difference to the liar. The truth telling, the voting, the choosing makes a difference to the chooser. So it makes a difference to the person who's doing it, even if we can't make things happen out there in the world. Um, Ajahn Chah, you know, kind of the teacher of teachers and the Vipassana tradition pointed out that you can water a fruit tree, but you cannot make it give you an apple. In other words, we can tend to the causes, but we cannot control the results. So we, we aim for the results we value. That's legitimate, certainly. While meanwhile, trying to be at peace with a recognition of so much that's just out of our control. That's one. And then other uh, is you might know the classic story of the starfish. Uh, two people are walking along the seashore. Millions of starfish have been cast up by a storm and a rising tide, and now the tide has receded, and they're dying in the sun. And as the two people walk, one of them reaches down periodically with every couple steps and tosses one of the starfish back into the ocean. Maybe if after half an hour or an hour of this, you know, that person's friend gets a little irritated at the interruption of it all and says, hey, look, it's not making any difference whatsoever. And the one who's tossing back the starfish says, no, it makes all the difference in the world to the ones I return to the sea. And in that way, I think too, uh, our individual actions definitely have impacts as well. So thank you very much, Becky, and um, take care. I think it's important to take heart. And, uh, you know, as the Buddha said, tread the path with care uh, and to not lose heart and not let the forces of oppression make us lose heart, dishearten us, because that's one of the very first things that authoritarians at all levels try to do is convince people that it's hopeless because then people move into despair and they give up. Instead, um, I think it's really important to hold on to that felt sense of heart, uh, if only for the value of what we do for its own sake and claim the power we have inside our own minds with our words and our deeds and use it. Okay, so I'm looking to see other people. I see someone named Sherry. Great, Sherry, I'm unmuting Karen. you. Karen. Okay, good. Hi. Hey there. Thank you, Rick. I believe um, completely in the truth of what you're saying. Um, serenity is elusive. Yeah. Um, and I feel so strongly that serenity is silence and it does more harm than good, especially now. Um, oh. I have some history with trauma and I can yeah. tell you that if somebody can look you in the eye and say, I am so sorry, that never should have happened. And I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure I've got your back. That is tremendous. So I don't know quite how to reconcile the sense of trying to achieve serenity with the urgency of standing with people who need somebody at their back. Oh yeah. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. That's something that I'm, you know, grappling with myself. Other people have spoken out about it as well. And in the Buddhist tradition, there are a number of people, in, uh, including many um, people of color who have grappled with this territory of engaged Buddhism, sometimes it's called. You can see the similar kind of issue in, in other traditions as well. And I'm trying to speak from my own experience here. What I notice inside myself, not notice, I mean, what I know I can feel inside myself is that both things can really be present at the same time. There can be uh, a very heavy heart and there can be a cold, just a rage, you know, just a, I'm a pretty calm guy and there can be just this absolutely appalled, outraged, fiery, fierce quality. You know, I'm feeling some of it right now, while at the same time, somehow there can be a sense of an underlying ground of just profound equanimity underneath it all. And the, and the two coexist. And I, I know for myself that if I'm just carried away by the, by the rage, I burn out after a while. That actually uh, being able to tap into that underlying spaciousness and stillness in some ways enables me to keep on going. And I'll just say that about myself. And it's an ongoing exploration. Um, and one way to 
to tap into that is to recognize that awareness itself is serene in the sense that awareness is a stable field through which experiences pass. So to the extent that we're in touch with just the felt sense of awareness while being with and honoring all else that moves through it, that's a way to experience both of that. Uh, also, um, I think as we develop traits of tranquility and deep down inside and, and calm that we can return to or recover to after we've been, sometimes for good reason, massively agitated out of them, that helps to refuel and repair, you know, the soft animal of the body, as Mary Oliver Puss said. So then, kaboom, we can go out and fight the good fight one more time. So I, that's how it shows up for me. Thank you, Rick. Thank, oh, yeah, but thank you. It's an absolutely important question. And um, I think there's a wisdom, honestly, for myself and a courage in being willing to be disturbed, you know. Being, being brave enough to look at all levels, whether it's about social justice issues or just in general, to let other people land and let them disturb us. And paradoxically, one thing that helps us be more capable of opening to others and letting them disturb us is we feel a growing internal stability uh, and, and ultimately undisturbable stability of presence of mind and um, inner peace. Kind of wild, they, they go together. Okay, I'm gonna keep moving here, trying to get as many voices in the room as I can get. Um, just seeing, scrolling along, anybody else, particularly people who haven't spoken. Although if you have, okay, I'm moving through, going back. Julian, at some point, if you wanna speak up, definitely welcome to do that. I see Gail. I'm going to unmute you, Gail. There you are with the forest behind you. Unmuting Gail. There you are. Great. Hi. So um, your last comment was a perfect segue to what I wanted to say. Yeah. And it's an it's a acknowledgement and a thanks to Julian mm -hmm. for bringing me out of some level of complacency. Like I think very often I just cocoon myself. Yeah. In my practice and this is a time when we need to go from practice to practicality okay. uh, and there was a for me there was a call to action that yeah. came after our session last week where I realized I had all this fear you know because of the pandemic because of you know the protests but instead of being fear it suddenly turned into a pillar of courage Hmm. Just like you referenced, it just felt yeah. like I've had a pillar of courage come through me. I've taken several action steps this week, which have encouraged me, encouraged me, and given me more courage. So, hmm. I just want to acknowledge that I know it was uncomfortable for Julie to bring up those topics, that topic, but I think it was something we, we, needed. So we needed. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Gail. Appreciate that. Um, let's see. I saw, hang on one second. Susanna? There you are, Susanna, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Oh, uh, yeah, hi. I didn't think you were going to call on me. <laughs> oh, yeah, can be startling. Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I guess my question is um, more in like dealing with, like, I feel a lot of what you're talking about, like, disturbed by all this. And I have some history that I don't want to get too much into, like, with my family. Um, around this that some of this is triggered um and they're not disturbed so being in a situation where you feel disturbed and you're almost the one rocking the boat um like why are you making us uncomfortable how do you rectify that or you balance that out in your own head if that's enough information Oh, I get it. Um, I have relatives who are very conservative myself. And um, and I think it goes, I mean, obviously it relates to social justice issues and it relates to other kinds of issues where we just know that if we share our experience or say what we want, make a request, um, even in the calmest, most, you know, Gandhi-ish way, whatever, 
other people would be disturbed, let alone if we claim our right, frankly, to be fiery about it, to have had it at a certain point up to here. Uh, you know, how do we deal with, how do we, how do we integrate compassion and the wish to relieve suffering with the knowing that our actions in this moment will create suffering for that other person, or in the sense that they'll be uncomfortable or they'll have reactions they won't like. Maybe they'll look bad, in fact, in front of other people, for example. So how do we, we balance that? And I think about that, um, there's no ultimate you know, formula. I, I know you're not seeking one, I just wanna name that. The Buddha talked about certain guidelines and the one he especially emphasized was intention. I think is deeply powerful and actually radical. In his time, there was a lot of focus on empty ritual. And he said, no, empty ritual does not make a person holy. Deeds make a person holy. Deeds of thought and word and behavior. So, um, you know, the question really is, what's my intention here? Is my intention to prove my point? Is my intention to just sort of spew? Is my intention to, you know, win points with other people who are watching alongside? Or is my intention to speak up for myself if to have no other impact? Is my intention to ally with others and to name the impacts on others and, or to bear witness to the lives of others, the, the suffering of others, even if it doesn't have any material effect on their suffering or in the outcomes? You know, what are my intentions? So I think if, you're, if your heart's in the right place, it's kind of classic, if your heart's in the right place, uh, if your intentions are good, then you keep on going. And, um, you know, it's interesting how the Buddha described wise speech or right speech. He said it had five conditions and a, fit, and a sixth desirable but not necessary condition, which is it was well-intended, it was actually beneficial, uh, at least to the person who was speaking it. It was um, true. In other words, it wasn't exaggerated. It wasn't over the top. It was true. It was not a lie. Also, it was timely, and it was expressed without harsh tone. Now, what is harsh tone? Can we be fiery? Can we be intense? Can we, can we be angry? I don't think of that as harsh tone. I think of harsh tone as demeaning, ill will, tearing down, uh, vitriolic, destructive, you know, and then people decide sometimes culturally what is or is not, you know, harsh tone. There's some room to breathe there. But, you know, harsh tone. We kind of know when it's inbounds or out of bounds. And then ideally, number six, speech is wanted. But that's not a necessary condition necessarily. They may not want to hear it. And frankly, that's too bad, right? I think uh, my own personal opinion is that, um, you know, silence is a privilege. And uh, I had a very wise person who happens to be my son uh, point that out to me, maybe quoting some other people. And as someone previously kind of implied, it's a privilege to remain silent sometimes. And we need to claim our voice and, and, and vote in the broadest sense with what we say and what we do. So that's kind of my feeling about it. Did you want to say a little bit more about that? Then I'll keep going. Yeah, I was just going to say one other thing. That was very helpful. Thank you. Um, the other thing I was going to add was something you just touched on, reminded me of a quote, something about along the lines of like, conflict avoided is conflict turned internally. Yeah. So, I think that's yeah. true too. Yeah. Um, and classically too, there's a choice some we sometimes make. We balance truth and harmony. <laughs> truth versus harmony. And sometimes appropriately, we choose harmony over truth. You know, it's a Thanksgiving dinner. It's not the time to get into that argument with Uncle Bob after he's had a couple martinis. We're just going to let that one go by. All right. Other times we say, you know, I'm going to speak truth here. You're going to do what you do, you know, over there. It's out of my control. But what's in control is I'm going to speak for myself. I'm going to name it as I see it. And I'm going to try to be skillful about it. But after that, I recognize that it's out of my power. You're going to do whatever you do. Right. So we choose truth over harmony. One thing I would say over the long haul is that in important relationships about important matters, and I think we're seeing some of the results of that at the collective level of, of our country altogether, if we keep choosing harmony over truth, after a while we have neither. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Susanna. Yeah. No, thank you. All right. Yeah. And one last thing we can have compassion for people while we make them frickin' uncomfortable, while we pursue justice, 
we can still have compassion for the impact on them. You know, and that's a very interesting place to explore. It's like that, it's a different, it's a different kind of intersection than the previous one I mentioned of serenity uh, and fieriness. Okay, yeah. And I think in a funny kind of way, while we retain that compassion for those we are completely willing to make extremely uncomfortable, it helps us be more skillful. And it's no guarantee, but it increases the odds of a good outcome. If only in the minds of others who are watching on, looking on. Okay, so we have just four more minutes. I wanna definitely end on time and I wanna see if there are other voices here. Um, Julian, excellent. I'm unmuting you, Julian. Hopefully this will work. There you go, please. Yeah, I just, I, so sorry, I was, I, uh, well, not sorry. I've been hesitating to say something because I, I've been getting a lot of texts or the past week from my, uh, you know, uh, uh, white friends asking me like, <clears throat> well, uh, are you okay? What can I do? And, you know, they're, they're wondering what to do. You know, just they're, they're just, I don't know what to do. Like I, and I think <clears throat> do something, you know, um, like you said, silence is a privilege. Uh, if you're doing, do something. If you don't know what to do, do do what feels right in your heart, doing anything. If you don't wanna just give money, you think just giving money to an organization feels empty, then give more money. And eventually maybe you won't feel empty anymore if you just give more money. Um, I just wanna make a brief point about some people who might feel uncomfortable about some of the violence that's been going on. Look, I'm not a big fan of the looting. I don't think anybody is. And I know that there's some groups of people that are taking advantage of the situation. So you're probably sitting there going, you know, I, I, I wanna respect the protest. I just don't, I just don't get the, the violence going on. I, <clears throat> I was at the uh, Monday night inside LA uh, uh, Spirit Rock um, uh, meditation setting that Jack Cornfield was speaking at and uh, he brought it up and he said hey you know I actually respect the violence and he brought up a quote as uh, uh, I looked it up later it's an Ethiopian proverb um, uh, the child who is not embraced by the village will burn it down to fill its warmth um, but back to the doing something and another quote that I want to do is like you know the 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 system when you see people getting brutalized and right now it's just it's the protesters you know the the, the protesters are a very diverse group and you're seeing a lot of tear gas and 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 rubber bullets being fired uh uh by uh, law enforcement indiscriminately at these protesters not just black protesters white protesters too um, and you know what, that, that's got to do something to you because the system's going to test the limit of its power on those who are at the bottom of the hierarchy. Um, uh, uh, there, there's a quote from a, <clears throat> excuse me, from a priest, um, Nazi Germany, um, where he says, uh, uh, you know, first they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the socialists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a socialist. And they came for the trade unionists. I didn't speak out because I wasn't a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews and I didn't speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. So yeah. this Thank is you. our time. This is our time to change the system. Yeah. And where are you gonna be in history when you look back on it? Thank you. I have a suggestion. Uh, I would do this normally if we were meeting in person. That we just all sit together for a minute or so. Basis in an MVP yeah. Hang on a second. Muting everyone. Okay, so Julian, I'm gonna mute you again. Thank you very much for that. And let's just sit here and feel the weight of it for a minute or two. And then we'll end formally. And those who want, I encourage you to stick around and we'll put you in breakout rooms and you can have a chance to talk about this, this further, okay? So I'll do it with you. This 
being together, feeling it, whatever you're feeling. Heart opening. Not needing to have all the answers. Allowing contradiction, confusion. Also allowing clarity. Knowing what your vote is in the broadest sense. Perhaps it's appropriate to end on the Buddha's teaching that one is truly wise, who is peaceable, friendly, and fearless. <laughs>